Thank you everyone for joining us today. We're going to give people a few minutes to join and get settled. We will start promptly at 1 p.m. If you're just joining us, uh, we're going to give people a few more minutes to join the webinar. We will start promptly in about a minute. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us in today's webinar. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Katie Ramsberg, Director of CARS Affiliates Program and Marketing Communications. We're glad that you could join us. Before we get started, we have a few housekeeping slides. During the webinar, your mic, your mic will be muted, so please use the chat box to submit your questions. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website later today. The CAR team is working hard to produce weekly webinars. This week we have two. Our next webinar is on Thursday, April 30th at 1 p.m. Sponsorship opportunities are available. CAR researchers have been working hard since late January to track the impacts of COVID-19 on the automotive industry and to share that information with you. Please consider donating to support CAR's unfunded COVID-19 research. We have also been busy reimagining MBS as a virtual event, and we are excited to launch registration in the coming days. An email announcing the registration relaunch will be in your inbox soon. CAR affiliates and ACP members look for an email with your coupon code discount. Thank you, and now I'd like to introduce you to CAR's president and CEO, Carla Bello. Thank you, Katie. Welcome, everyone. I hope that this uh, particular webinar finds you safe and, and your family and yourselves healthy 
and uh, managing through, I think this is now week seven of our shutdown. So our whole new life, um, I, I hope that everything is going well for you. I, I always feel for those that are juggling work and children and you know, educating them and, and managing everything as, as you are. I think this is very relevant considering what just transpired in the state of Michigan. Um, we did extend the stay home order. We know the automakers are anxious to get back to work. We know the suppliers are anxious to get back to begin to support them. But paramount is the health of the employees, the safety of the workplace as we, as we really enter a new era that none of us have ever dealt with before. So, and the ability to use data and data analytics to understand if people are healthy or not, to understand perhaps paths of tr uh, transmission are really, re really vital. And I think as we begin to see more and more states start to open up various elements of society again, you know, this, this kind of data and traceability is, is vitally important. Um, to be able to manage the health and be managing our new life as normal. So today we've, we're very lucky to have two different companies here with three speakers. I'm going to take time to, to tell you about the companies and to introduce the speakers and then I'll hand over to them for their presentations. So first um, we have Qualtrics, which is an SAP company. It's a leader in, they are a leader in customer experience and creator of the experience management category. Qualtrics changes the way organizations manage and improve four core experiences of business, customer, employee, product, and brand, and serves over 11,000 organizations globally. Organizations use Qualtrics to listen, understand, and take action on experience data, the beliefs, emotions, and intentions that tell you why things are happening and what to do about it. The second company is Draper, and Draper is a not-for-profit engineering innovation company that focuses on the design, development, and deployment of advanced technological solutions for the world's most challenging and important problems. The company provides engineering solutions directly to government, industry, and academia, works on teams as prime contractor or subcontractor, and participates as a collaborator in consortia. They are located in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Our first speaker today is from SAP Qualtrics and it's Bill Newman. And he is the North America Executive Industry Advisor at SAP, providing industry perspective, strategic business advice and thought leadership to support automotive and discrete industry customers and their co-innovation programs. He has over 30 years of experience in strategy, IT, and risk planning across multiple industry sectors. Joining him from Qualtrics is Dave Mingle, and he's the global automotive industry leader. Dave champions the company's commitment to experience management leadership by building a world-class team, go-to-market strategy, and customer-centered culture tightly aligned with the needs of the global automotive and future mobility industries. And from Draper today, we have Dr. Troy Lau. He's a machine intelligence group leader and distinguished member of technical staff at Draper. He has a team of 30 staff and students that have deployed operational big data machine learning technologies for the intelligence community, as well as commercial customers and have delivered capabilities across a range of domains from biomedical, financial, defense, intelligence, and other areas. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn over the, the um, presentation to Bill and Dave, and at their conclusion, we'll, we'll uh, hand it over to Troy. So thank you, Bill, take it away. Well, thanks, Carla, and thanks everybody for joining today. It's uh, really an unprecedented time, and we are very grateful to, uh, to have a small moment of your time today to uh, share with you what we believe to be a very good emerging story coming out of the state government 
uh, as a part of our work with the Silicon Slopes and uh, SAP Qualtrics. Um, so thank you for the introduction and uh, uh, my colleague Dave and I would like to share with you just a little bit about what we believe uh, is an opportunity to leverage the work uh, with Test Utah and a number of other states as a blueprint for going safely back to work. <clears throat> So again, I'll just touch briefly on some industry impacts and directions, and then I'm gonna hand it over to Dave, who can go a little deeper into the Test Utah program and give some long-term considerations and also provide uh, where you can find some additional resources if you'd like to learn more. So I think it's important to do as a frame of reference uh, kind of where the impacts and the direction are. And I don't wanna to take too much time in terms of kind of where we're at in terms of volumes or anything like that. I think most of the people on the call today have been through probably uh, two, three, four industry presentations a week on that, uh, including the very good material that uh, the Center of Automotive Research is providing on a regular basis. Um, but I just wanna touch on perhaps maybe the humanistic elements of how we figure out how to go back to work. Um, so for sure, you know, we're displaced. Many of us are still self-quarantined or we're in stay-at-home orders. Many of us have variable individual uh, health impacts uh, that we're dealing with. Uh, these are This crisis is impacting individuals very differently across geographies and, and in those geographies at specific work locations very differently. Um, so obviously there are geographic and location safety health impacts. Um, what it's potentially doing in terms of the psyche of our uh, workers is, is really a, a very interesting conversation. Many of them have had to deal with a lot of things that you know no one's had to deal with ever before and, and on multiple levels. And of course, those translate down into the value chain uh, with a number of different uncertainties. So I think everybody's aware the industry is looking to return to work as safely as possible. Uh, we're going to have to reinvent some work methods. You know, ironically enough, we're probably going to have to unlean a lot of processes that we're currently working with to build product and to build parts and to move forward. Um, obviously, we have to coordinate against the rolling, uneven, and scaled restart. All locations are not created equal. Locations that build product, that don't build product or parts, um, distribution centers, they all have to be evaluated. And I think the piece that we're gonna get into today is that we're finding the workforce readiness is very uncertain. And that not only translates into a specific company, but also into their specific value chain as well. There can be a lot of reasons why companies like yours may have um, um, some employee or supplier employee readiness. And we believe at SAP Qualtrics, that there's a really big risk in taking workplace readiness for granted. Um, your employer, your employees could have uh, personal uh, illness issues that they're working with or illnesses of a personal relative or a partner that they're caring for. Uh, clearly for those of you who are having to learn how to homeschool your children or figure out other programs to keep them busy day by day, um, having children at home and trying to work for home is, is, is a very challenging situation. Um, we also believe that there's going to be a certain physical unwillingness on the part of certain people who may feel themselves well or not to go back into work. Maybe um, this has taken a toll on them. Um, interesting stories about you know, typical personal injuries and not being able to find medical care. And we also believe that there's a certain psychological unwillingness that may impact people's belief in terms of uh, the workplace being safe, or maybe I just don't feel like um, wearing PPE per requirement now moving forward in this next normal is something I'm really actually comfortable with in terms of returning to work. As we saw in 2008, 2009, uh, workers, some workers may want to just hit the life pause button and fi figure out something new to do. Maybe they've been temporarily displaced and they found something else that is more fulfilling for them, or, or they're simply going to opt out and go for early retirement, which is again something we saw coming out of the Great Recession. So we really do believe that assessing your workforce prior to coming back to work is extremely important. 
Um, just to double click on that, uh, SAP had a recent virtual industry um, uh, seminar and we asked business leaders coming into the early parts during the middle of March about their impact to the COVID crisis. And no big surprise when we asked them what the top two uh, business, pressing business challenges were that supply chain readiness and disruptions, lost productivity topped the list. Um, as well dampened sales, but also impacts to global markets, uh, currencies, and of course, uh, employee health and morale. So uh, we really do believe that uh, there's, there's good work to be done in terms of understanding the disposition of, of our employees before they go to work and those of your suppliers as well. And to that, you know, we believe that a three-prong approach, assess, trust, test, and trace um, allows us to get a, a bead on what are some of the issues potentially facing employees and those of um, the supply chain to come back to work. Testing as needed to find out if you actually are a carrier of the coronavirus and being able to employ certain trace methods around that um, so that we have a better understanding of what are the relative health and safety of our workforce population is on a company and regional basis. And to that, I'm really excited to be able to uh, introduce Dave Mingle. He's my uh, partner in crime, responsible for global industries with Qualtrics, and really share with you a compelling story coming out of Test Utah that's being adopted as well by other state um, agencies and where we think is, is a very good fit to potentially help the automotive industry and other industries as companies look to go back to work. Um, so Dave, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. Great, thank you very much, Bill. Could you advance the next slide, please? Uh, so Test, Test Utah is a partnership between Silicon Slopes, Utah-based tech companies, of which Qualtrics is one. We are based in Provo, Utah, and the entire state of Utah. The goal is to dramatically increase the rate of testing and stem the spread of COVID-19 and expand quickly to other states, which we now have in Iowa, Nebraska, and others to come. To date, we've, we've already completed several hundred thousand assessments and facilitated folks to that require testing to find that testing uh, in, their, uh, in their local area and um, uh, get help as needed. Next slide. So here's how it works. It's pretty simple. The participant completes an online assessment. That assessment has been developed in conjunction with local health authorities to make sure that it is professional and you can count and trust on it. And depending on the risk level that's identified, the participant is asked to schedule an appointment at a local testing facility. The participant then drives to the testing facility, presents a QR code without ever even having to leave their, their car, uh, that QR code is scanned, so all of the information that the individual may have already provided is immediately made available to the testing facility, and the test is administered. Following getting the test results back, the participant receives that through a secure email, and if required, there are recommended next steps for that person's care. Now we've learned a lot about how to do this for states. Like I mentioned, we have several states that are up and running and doing so at scale, several hundred thousand assessments already, uh, already completed. Now we do know that when we transition this as a framework into uh, companies that there are going to be things that are gonna have to operate uh, differently. But we've learned a lot and we think we can move fairly quickly as we do repurpose this platform for the use uh, by companies and specifically within the automotive industry. The first thing, and Bill already touched on this, is understanding employee readiness to return to work will be critical. As part of that assessment up front, it's not only a medical assessment, but you can also start to assess people's willingness to work, their ability to work, uh, what special conditions or uh, supports may they need to be able to return to work. And all of that helps to build trust that their workplace is and will continue to be safe after they return to work. Um, of course, the platform has to be HIPAA compliant. Uh, this is very sensitive information that has to be protected appropriately. 
Uh, also, we have to build in a consent functionality to allow employees to opt in to share the assessment and test results with their employer. Uh, but in all cases, we expect that the employer will be in control of the data that employees make available to them and let the employer determine how the results will be used internally. It could just be for analytics or it could be something as significant as or important as uh, perhaps certification and whether an individual is going to be allowed to come back to work or not. Again, those we believe are the uh, decisions that get made by an employer um, and will have to be taken into account on a case-by-case -case basis. Next. So three big things that we think the, uh, uh, the, the platform can solve. First is self-attestation. By deploying a common assessment methodology designed by professionals, this isn't something you would do, say, facility by facility or state by state. Uh, although it certainly could be localized if those conditions required. But the point is you want to have a common methodology. So as you're doing your analytics, you know how that data has been collected, the questions that have been asked, and how well you can compare uh, across your entire population. We can make it simple for the company, or the employee, excuse me, to be able to schedule uh, testing. Uh, and, and as addition to enable contact tracing, so if someone does, um, indicate they are high risk or perhaps have had COVID or, or do have COVID, that you could then uh, understand where that person's been and what other portions of your employee population uh, may need to be notified. This is part of several uh, solutions that we have published over the last uh, several weeks. Uh, we have 13 in total, including uh, remote and on-site work pulse and the others that you see here. We'll have additional announcements later this week about additional back to work apps uh, that can be part of this holistic solution that I just described. Uh, we do have a number of resources that are available to uh, learn more about the Test Utah uh, platform and would love to, to get in contact with you and discuss how we can take this framework and apply it to uh, your specific situation. Uh, if you, um, we'll send this out, but there is a QR code here that you can scan on your phone to get access to some of the documentation you see on the screen, as well as a link. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Troy. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Dave. Let me get my screen. Hi, everybody. All right. So what happens if we follow everything Bill and Dave says and we decide as companies that we're ready to go? We have unlocked our factory doors, our offices, um, our shared spaces. The word that I keep coming back to is how can we be tactical about how we operate our spaces in this pandemic world? And how can we use data science to be truly tactical. So I'm gonna use that tactical word a number of times. And, and what I see happening is a collision as we open up our doors between this personal pandemic world that we've been experiencing. And what I mean by personal, I mean the grocery store, right? It's something we do in our personal time has become, going through a grocery store has becoming like drawing out plays in a football game or a chess match or walking down the street when you see someone coming on the same sidewalk as you. It's become a game of chicken. And, oh, do I cross the street? There's someone on the other side. Maybe I should go down the middle. Those are all little tactical decisions we make in our personal life to follow social distancing. And other rules, right? In our professional lives, how we interact digitally, how we communicate, how we share work has completely changed as well. Those two realities are going to be on a collision course as we get back to work. So on a collision course, what do I mean? I mean that em as employees and employers, we are going to be asking questions and we will answer questions like, should I come in at 8.30 when everybody else comes in? And should I come in through the north entrance of my building? Or should I wait till 8.35 and come in in the south entrance or the back door where it's much less quiet? Is it safe to go to the lunchroom? And if I do, should I sit on the left side or right side? Should I go to the bathroom down the hall because it's pretty crowded or should I go up a floor? And we're all gonna have to answer the question, 
oh shoot, did I interact with Joe last Tuesday because Joe just got confirmed positive. Um, all these questions are gonna have to be answered in order for us to be smart about reopening our spaces. So what we're trying to do is use data science and AI to be very smart and tactical as we answer these questions. And what does that mean? It means we can design specific work hours. We can optimize social distancing. We can identify parts of buildings to clean more often than others. And of course, we can do contact tracing within our company. Um, what's done today? Everybody's hearing about all the big tech companies of the world, Apple, Google, doing large scale contact tracing and population mapping to both map the spread and hopefully identify clusters of activity. That's very important. What none of those analyses and technologies do is tell us where and where in our little 100 square foot or 100 by 100 foot space or when we're in our buildings, what to do. All those technologies are on a much bigger, larger scale. As companies, we're gonna need to be able to understand what's happening within our buildings. Um, on the bright side, as you'll see, a lot of the hardware and other um, kind of IT capabilities to enable this probably already exist in most companies. And it'll just mean a redeployment or a new application of data science and AI on these existing data streams to make use of them. Um, and another big advantage which I'll touch on is you've all heard privacy protection, privacy protection, privacy protection. It makes Google and Apple's jobs very hard. It makes a lot of universities' jobs hard. Um, uh, fortunately, if we're working internally with a company, a lot of these privacy, privacy protections um, are not as much of a challenge um, because employees understand that they're trapped within a business. Um, and as you see, as I mentioned, we'll be able to leverage a lot of existing technologies. I'm gonna talk about at the end, um, beyond data science, some of the physiometric, standoff physiometric approaches that Draper has worked on and how we might be able to deploy some of these in the cloud to get us working with um, different companies and sharing our techniques. So I would be lying if I said this was a grand business idea that we came up with two months ago. We came up with two months ago because the CEO asked me, as, as leading, being one of the main data science people in the company, asked me, we've got data coming in of when people badge into our building. Um, can you tell me how many people are in the building? Can you tell me when people come in? Um, it, it started off as a very real challenge and problem to our company. So all of these ideas did not come as a business idea. All of these came as what needs to be done at Draper. And some of these plots we're seeing are actual plots and technologies that we've built to operate at Draper. And we operate because as a defense contractor, um, a week after everything closed, the DOD deemed us essential to the um, military industrial base and we had to reopen. So we had to face that a lot of the challenge that, challenges that a lot of other companies are going to be facing too. So the first layer of things that you can do with data within your company is kind of kind of the more high level data science building floor activity level analysis. So what do I mean, right? So data sources, almost every company has badges, badge swipes, you put your badge into your workstation, all that data is recorded somewhere. Um, companies have cell phones, corporate cell phones, they are able to track where company computers are plugged in, if maybe you don't have a fixed desk. Um, other companies um, have you know, RFID tokens, whether it's in their IDs or Bluetooth trackers, um, and whether it's coming from security or IT, all these things are recorded. Um, they're recorded at Draper. Right off the bat, you can get some extremely informative metrics from this. So the, the, the space on the right you're seeing um, for a Draper building, just how people come into the building, the top left, and when they're there at different times of day. On the top right, you're seeing um, entries and exits at specific points in the building. You're seeing how long people spend in the building. And on the bottom right, you're seeing what rooms or spaces are most active. Um, you can imagine all these can you know, tell you things like, okay, if I need to space out shifts, when can I space them out? If I need to you know, have not everybody come into the lobby at 8.30 a.m., you can do that. Um, if certain rooms are getting too crowded over capacity and you can't 
um, distance at six feet, um, these plots can tell you that as well. Now, there's a number of others we create on a daily basis to really help our leadership make tactical decisions on how they get people um, back into the building and working smartly. We can go a uh, level deeper. Um, beyond the high level metrics, we can track, trace, and predict movements throughout the building. Um, on the left side, you're seeing an actual floor pan of one of our buildings, and you're seeing areas that are more active in deeper red, areas that are less active in white, and some areas of the building that are still um, not active. Um, once again, this can come from simple badge and technologies. Um, on the top right, if you're operating a factory floor, um, whether you've got badges or you are looking at people through cameras, you can generate heat maps of where people are. This can tell you, you know, people congregate here by the water cooler. Maybe I should um, wipe that area down um, more often, or maybe I should tell people to disperse from there. Um, on the bottom right, so this is a prettier picture of um, the contact tracing algorithm that we've built. Um, the actual algorithm just spits out a um, PowerPoint, so this is a little nicer. But um, unfortunately, for every any company of reasonable size, we're all going to have to do contact tracing in the near future if we haven't already. And we've deployed this algorithm to basically tell us who might have been near one person or another and um, allow us in a purely data-driven way to find out instantaneously if someone's confirmed positive who they interacted with. And this is really important because, as we know, with old school way, it's rife with um, challenges. People don't know or don't remember who they've interacted with. And oftentimes, you don't know who might have been a foot behind you briefly in the hallway. Um, the last bit of technologies, which, which are um, kind of some here I'm talking about a lot of things Draper has done in the past, but I've seen more and more stories come out, articles in 60 Minutes, they talked about how the auto initiative is deploying um, what we call standoff physiometrics. So these are everything from people are talking about measuring people, whether they have fevers, and we've seen that. Um, Draper itself has a long history of building these things for everything from um, gait patterns, movement patterns, um, audio or speech. Um, you can get detect things like coughs. You can um, maybe detect if someone is sick from their coughs. Um, and that goes into general activity pattern recognition. Um, these can exist, once again, with new sensors you put into your factories, or Draper is actively working on a project with DARPA um, that puts warfighter health analytics, basically can detect if a soldier is sick just on the cell phone that they're carrying around in their pocket. Um, once again, these are what I call standoff physiometrics, things that you don't need to attach to anyone to understand if they're sick. Um, so that was kind of a blitz through all the things we are have already deployed in this pandemic and all the things that we have built and could deploy in this pandemic. Um, we're realizing every day um, the new analytics we can apply to the space to, to make our building operate more safely. We're taking our technologies that were created elsewhere and reallocating them and using them to make smart decisions within our building. Um, and like I said, this is, this is not some brilliant business plan that we came up with. This is a real thing that we built to help ourselves. And now we would love to talk to other people um, and help get this out there because once again, we have to be tactical with how we respond to this in our shared spaces. And um, if we do that, um, I think we can get our factories and our spaces open sooner and more smartly and hopefully keep them open. I will hand it back. Thank you, Troy. If we could get the slide up again that shows all the panelists, that would be great. If not, that's fine. And if the panelists want to get their webcams back going, that would be great for those of you that can. So Troy, I was I was intrigued with um, you know thinking about my goodness when you bring a lot of people into the office and different times of starting work and you know how are you going to keep people apart six feet and where am I going to sit in the in the cafeteria all these questions and I, I have a little funny story I went to a local park. 
I'm a jogger and I, and I went there and there were several, this was a nice day a few weeks ago. There were several people there with families and in larger groups. And there was a particular person walking down the, the path coming the opposite way that I was that had a six foot stick, a literal stick that, you know, <laughs> if anybody got closer than six feet, she was pointing out, you know, how, you know, how you were supposed to not be there. And I thought that was a little extreme, but nonetheless, it really makes you begin to think about, you know, what is this new uh, world going to be like? So when I think about that, how long did it take you to morph this model of your office building? How long did it take you to accurate, begin to accurately predict where the hot zones are and you know where how then you can think about reconfiguring entry and entrance points? Yep. How much data did you have to get and how long did it take? So and not are you much. still I'll give gathering you, I'll give you it? Yes, we are we are doing this every single day and making decisions and continuing to build algorithms. But um, it happened on the first day and one thing that made it very obvious. So in our building, we have a big atrium with, I think, maybe four or six turnstile entry points. Um, you, you may have heard that people always buy themselves either turning right or going to the middle. So we have six entry points and the exact number I think is 250 people a day go through the middle turn style and like 20 go through the left turn style. They take you to the exact same place. Hmm. That it was like, oh my God, you know, we, we've got way more people because that's what they naturally do, go through the middle. If we just be smart about it and say, you know, if your birthday is January through May, go through this one, you can take a high traffic point and turn it into you know, and spread it out in terms of low traffic points really quickly. So I think it became mm -hmm. really apparent that there's really simple things you can implement with data that you're probably getting readily really quickly. Um, some other things, um, you know, to go to more time to develop, but but that's uh, similar to, to your park analogy. Mm -hmm. There's just simple spacing things you could do to make things safer. Thanks. Hey, Bill, I have a question for you. I thought the, the Test Utah program is, is quite interesting. What have you learned so far from deploying that? How, how has it helped them to perhaps make their state one of the first to be able to, to return to normalcy? Yeah, well, I, I, I'll make a comment and then I'll pass it over to Dave because I think he's closer to the specifics. But I think it was just, first of all, it was a great collaboration with the Silicon Slopes Initiative where, where SAP Qualtrics is a member and, and really coming together to not only address a specific need of, of a state jurisdiction, but also uh, at a broad level to, to really address the need of all of the citizens that then could be extrapolated regionally, nationally, uh, on a state by state basis. And I, I think that that piece in, in working in conjunction with um, health health systems providers and providing a certain level of confidentiality and accessibility to at the time you know think about it again it's only been a month right and and these uh, it was very difficult to get coronavirus testing even the swab testing mm -hmm. a mere 30 days ago so um, I think that that in and of itself has been a real uh, rallying cry uh, Dave maybe you can share where the future of this platform, at least in state jurisdictions, is heading. And then um, as time permits, we can go a little deeper into what the ramifications would be for uh, auto and other industries. Yeah, and then before I forget, maybe some people don't know what Silicon Slopes is too. So maybe we can cover both of those. Dave, you got that? Sure, yeah, yeah, sure. Th thanks, Bill. Can, um, so Silicon Slopes is a consortium of local tech companies in the Utah area specifically around salt lake city if you've been there so if you drive salt lake city south uh to uh, provo which is about 45 miles you'll just see a slew of of tech companies that, that line that whole corridor so they got together to try to create an answer uh, a solution uh for uh what started with the the state of utah but now has expanded to to other states one big learning is if you can make it easy for people uh, they will come. They they will they will trust it. They will uh, take the time to do it. Uh, and you have to be transparent about it. You have to allow them to opt in to what they're going to do. Be very clear about what the next steps are going to be. What how their data is going to be handled. 
And if you can do that, especially right now, because people are legitimately concerned, uh, some more than others, but I think we all have some level of apprehension that we go when we go into large spaces, uh, who's been following the rules, Carla, just like you said, and who hasn't? And all it takes is one or two, no matter how good you are about it, uh, to possibly uh, endanger you as well. And of course, we all have loved ones and elderly, and we, you know, no one wants that to happen where we happen to bring it accidentally into our own homes and our own families. So it's important uh, to be able to provide something like this that is highly engaging, uh, very, very easy to, to stand up. We stood up the state of Utah in about a week from start to finish. So the platform, this is what we do for a living. We, we manage 3 billion customer touch points on our platform every year. We have over 11,000 clients. So we know how to move uh, quickly and to adapt what we do to handle uh, what we call experience gaps, places where we need to bring uh, people together with processes or other people and to try to make that as seamless as possible. Great. So, Troy, in, in in comparison, what what have you found, or has there been any surprises with the data that you've gathered, or you know, any learnings that are similar, or from a statewide level, uh, is there is there a comparison to what we can do inside the the facilities? Yeah, I mean, so. I think you see similar behavior, you know, within a building too. There are some people who follow. And some groups of people who follow the rules to the T, you see one person in a room at a time and they're obviously spacing them out on a schedule. And then you see evidence of people going through buildings that are obviously just chatting and walking through every checkpoint together. And you, mm -hmm. something tells me that they are not keeping six feet apart, if anything. Um, so so you, you can definitely see that. And, and, you know, I'll say the privacy thing, you know, maybe, maybe it's probably less of an issue when you're in a corporate environment. So maybe then you could just tell their manager to slap them on the wrist or, or behave better. But, but you definitely see both types of behavior and you can get at very specifics when you're looking within a company. I just want to maybe uh, echo something that I think Troy was alluding to. You know, we, in our conversations with automotive companies and, and their suppliers, we actually don't believe, despite the, the heroic collaboration and, and unprecedented collaboration between Apple and Google uh, to, to make contact tracing via phones, uh, our experience has been that, that these oftentimes get put in our, or left workers have to leave these in their cars or in lockers. Uh, they are not 100% verifiable uh, uh, applications in terms of where your physical presence is. And so we're also working with our partners to help do some of the management on the back end in terms of contact tracing. So if you have an IoT sensor, Troy, like you were talking about in your presentation, or, or Carla, you've mentioned wrist bracelets or uh, mm -hmm. maybe a sensor tab that gets put on your badge. You know, can't do anything about buddy punching in normal times anyway. So if somebody wants to swap <laughs> the bracelet out, they're going to do that. And they'll, as you said, Troy, there's going to be policies uh, to address uh, offenders in that type of case. But but being able to manage that and also being able to manage the cert certificates, as Dave, you suggested, in terms of going back to work, whether it's a per location basis or on a company wide basis, you know, uh, we believe that there we, we have good methods and approaches that uh, that could definitely also be repurposed, uh, whether it's track and trace or whether it's environmental health and safety management where these records could be uh, handled. You know, it's 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 not um, it's not rocket science, but it's very important to be able to make sure that people are supposed to be who have the ability to be in the place that they need to be in order to do their work legitimately, whatever the circumstances are, and COVID just provides another layer on top of that. So so let me ask a little bit about artificial intelligence because I'm not a guru of that, so I might be asking a dumb question, but if somebody leaves their phone in their car or if somebody tries to cheat the system by doing something weird with their wrist bracelet or their, their ID badge or whatever, can't you find that after analysis and after certain amounts of machine learning and, and understanding behaviors? Yeah, you, you absolutely can. I mean, the question is if, if their data just becomes more incomplete as, as you do that. So, mm -hmm. so if someone's, you know, 
you would hope someone's not intentionally subverting the system to then spread the disease around. But but if they're just being, you know, lazy or not following the protocol, you would hope that would come up in other sources. Um, you know, the other, the other way we're using um, AI is being able to predict um, into the future what our building um, occupancy and density is going to look like as well and how might that fluctuate on like a Monday versus a Friday. Um, and, you know, if you're looking population wise, a lot of that, the individual offenders get kind of smeared out um, as well. So it, it depends how detailed you want to get. That was kind of my, my next question for you, Troy, was related to visitors on site and or the variation from day to day. Let's say if you have some kind of a, a conference or a big meeting, mm -hmm. you know, how, how can you how can you manage that transient situation and, and levelize that out? So so right now we're doing it, you know, old school ways. We have leadership in our building asking for inputs from people like um, how many in a certain division is going to be up but you know if this was to become more a streamlined process i think it could be something as easy as let's count the amount of meetings in microsoft office um and and look at you know the the rooms booked um in your building and it would probably be a beautiful mapping between that and how busy you think your building or an area building is going to be Thanks. Hey, Bill and, and uh, Dave, I have a question for you from, from actually some of the attendees at, at this webinar. Have you learned anything from other global markets that, that you've utilized in any of your um, programs, either Test Utah or even uh, Draper Technologies? I'll defer to Dave if you want to have a go at that, Dave. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, Carla, you broke up just a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry. I was asking yeah, I about if you've had any learnings from uh, any any of the overseas um, countries that have had really good success in in managing COVID, be it South Korea um, or, or any of the others. Um, well, we have um, uh, we we have not launched the Test Utah platform outside of the United States, uh, but we certainly have. Um, you know, uh, offices around the world and are observing what, what is happening. I thought it was very interesting that Australia is now requiring uh, empl uh, or rec recommending uh, that em uh, employees uh, fill out an assessment pro uh, in order to regain access to, uh, to employment uh, and, uh, and trying to do that on a mass scale across their, their uh, entire population. So there's something here about what we're talking about that is very, very relevant, not just for uh, for the states, but really for any organization that is interested in in protecting their workforce and their workplace. So if we think about the test Utah and the and the the you know the, basically the assess test trace, how is how can that be applicable to the automotive world, both in the office and in the factory? Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's pretty applicable from the perspective of, you know, again, is your workforce ready? Are your value chain members ready? Again, we believe that it's a bit of a risk to presuppose that that's the case. Um, might also want to just point out that there's at least been some weather events that have also compounded all of people's ability to go back to work because there's been uh, facility damage in some of our automotive supply chain. So that could also be an application in this regard. Uh, being able, as Dave pointed out, to be able to partner with health services and, and systems in those areas. Some companies are going to run their own testing programs because they have scale. Uh, being able to, again, understand what needs to happen when you do go back to work. Um, I think it's a brilliant time if you're an industrial engineer to basically have to go back and remap some of these production environments uh, because they're going to need uh, specific uh, safety uh, panels, uh, uh, additional distances, and you know we want to be able to again be safe, but we also want to build vehicles in our industry. Um, so this is very, very important. I think also too uh, on the backside, if I can just make kind of a long-term comment, uh, we've seen and we've heard from many of uh, the participants on on, our, on today's program 
that there were some structural issues that were kind of winding up going into this crisis, you know, where we have excess of finished goods inventory available. And we were probably in some cases looking at maybe some temporary furloughs just to get, you know, balanced out with our inventory. Taking a long look at resilience in terms of companies and what they need to do to have their systems and processes in place to avoid tremendous impact due to whatever the next disruption is, I think it's going to be a very valuable lesson, not only for the auto industry, but for other industries in general. I, I do think that we, we caught ourselves a bit exposed on this one in certain key areas, um, and particularly in some of the lower tier supply, uh, supply base. And, and I do believe that there's an opportunity to get a bit more fit in that area so that when the next, whatever it is, the next tsunami in Japan happens or whatever, whatever disruption it could be, we're better prepared to handle it moving forward. Yeah, Bill, what I would, what I would like to add as well is that there's an interesting combination here of what we call operational data and experience data, uh, X and O data, if you will. So what Troy talked about was a lot of the O data. Where have people been? Uh, or I've talked about the the testing itself and a pass fail grade or whatever the assessment is is a is a piece of O data, right? It's something uh, physical or um, uh, operational, if you will, uh, in in how you describe this challenge. But there's the whole experience piece of it as well. Uh, people's emotional readiness uh, and and learning how to engage them and to pulse them in real time and to provide constant feedback and overlay that onto the operational data. While AI models may be uh, incredibly uh, powerful, nothing's more powerful than listening to the people in the process themselves and getting the best ideas of the people that are actually there and to be able to aggregate that in real time and overlay it onto everything we just talked about. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, a that's a great point. Yeah, I mean, and, and one of the challenges we've seen as we, we make this data public within our company is getting people to understand and read this data correctly, um, not to panic, but to think smart about it and how they can, you know, choose to live their work lives as they're back in the office. Yeah, I think that human element is really, really important, right? And the trust and the belief that this is going to make their workplace safer and, and uh, you know, prevent them possibly from this disease or some other disease. Uh, we haven't really ever done much, especially here in the U.S. when it comes to even colds or flu. I mean, you go to work because you're a trooper, right? You just go, you know, where I worked in Japan for five years, you got a cold, you wore a mask and you protected those around you from getting it. So it's a whole new mindset for everyone. That being the case, we are a society that values our privacy. So how does privacy fit into this data that you're gathering and mandatory testing, et cetera? Maybe I could have a go and then you know, hand it over to the other panelists. So uh, it's a great point, Carla, because you know what we're basically asking people do, to do, perhaps for the first time ever, is to yield their health and medical information as a prerequisite to going back to work. It, it's the new, it's the next normal. It's where we're at. Um, and so being able to produce, being able to handle that testing information in a way, as, as Dave mentioned, is HIPAA compliant, process that so that whatever threshold or standard that you might have to, to return to work then can be published in some type of innocuous uh, um, HIPAA agnostic uh, certificate. So that certificate is could just be the same as if I had training on a new machinery or if I had OSHA compliance to training for a particular facility and that can go into my personal record. So again, you know, being able from, we believe an approach would be to take some of the information that's produced in a platform like Test Utah and be able to basically use that as a certification uh, platform to then provide some type of documentation that says on this date for this person, for these locations, you are certified to go back to work. Whether you're trained to work on the machine or you've got OSHA training for that, it's the same type of, of uh, depersonalized information that's stored. And so again, this is one emerging approach. 
we're, we're having a lot of different conversations. But, but I think when you can, can take that down to that level and then be able to manage that without the risk of having anyone's you know, personal medical information residing in a, uh, uh, in, a, in a corporate environment, we think that that is a good goal to have. And, and that's, that's where many of our conversations are tracking right now. Yeah, you have to be able to listen. You have to be able to understand. And most importantly of all, you've got to act. What we find is that people are, are, are willing to provide you their feedback, in some cases, uh, very personal information about their situation. Uh, and as long as they see that action results from that that benefits them, then there tends to be a value exchange that that uh, is trusted and people are continuing to willing to, to engage. So the only advice I would have for for the for everyone on the line here is don't do this if your senior leadership isn't committed to to understanding the results and doing something about the results themselves. And I think if they see leadership being proactive with the feedback they're getting and turning that into solutions that make the employees and the workplace overall safer, then the resistance uh, to giving up this information on behalf of your employees will be uh, far less. And I, and I can add, I'll, I'll just give us, you know, a specific example of the steps we've taken. So, I mean, as you saw, there's kind of two types of data we have. There's high level, you know, overall company-wide behavior. I think most people in general are safe with, you've got a histogram of everybody coming to the building. Nobody can complain that, oh, that, I'm that little bump. But um, for when we do contact tracing, for example, we've, we've taken two steps that are pretty standard in data science industry. Um, so basically, there's contact tracing. You're trying to protect the person who may have been a, positive case, which in theory only HR would know, uh, maybe, probably not, maybe not even person's manager. And then us, whether it's security, IT, or data science, looking at the data. So what we do is two things. One, we, we hash or anonymize, not anonymize, we hash the data. So we give everybody an identifier and only the person in HR has that key to unlock. And then another thing we do is I'll just pass over everybody's contact trace in the entire company to HR. There's nothing specific. If, if somebody wanted to look at me who didn't even come to the office, they could, right? And HR knows who they care about. I don't need to know who they care about. They can go into the data themselves and see it. So I think there's a, some steps there with we see the line between HR and the other parts of the building to, to keep people, you know, their privacy protected. Mm -hmm. just, just an example, if I can touch on that real quickly, you know, we've had, we've had com companies that we work with who have been a part of the essential food supply chain, they haven't stopped working, right? And, and we actually did have uh, one of those organizations have a coronavirus positive situation. They didn't have this data. They didn't have this science. They didn't have the tracing mechanism. So they literally had to close the facility, the entire facility, and put everyone on the payroll at that facility on paid self-quarantine for 14 days. In the future, to, to the point that I think we're all making, when we know more information, we can manage that information more appropriately down to more detail. Then what we can do is we can isolate the people who do need to go home and take care of themselves. As you said, Carla, prevent people from coming to work unwell in the first place, which I do think is going to be a significant next normal effect of all of this. But then the people who are left, if that facility is available, they can still continue to work in that line or in a different line, or maybe they get uh, work from home assignments, or they can go to another plant operations mm -hmm. within a short drive distance from them. So we're, we're allowing people to work more as they are well, and that is definitely a net benefit in terms of taking advantage of some of these, uh, these practices that are emerging now that we're talking about today. Sure, Troy. I was I was also um, impressed by your ability to be able to figure out if people are unwell by you know certain mm -hmm. leading yep. indicators. Can that help at all with us in identification of people that are at high risk? Maybe um, you know when, once this virus happened here, even in my small office, I learned of people who were high risk that I never knew they were because we never talked yep. about it in the past. But a lot of people yep. are, gonna, are gonna be hesitant to give that kind of information. So is there a way that we can glean that from, I don't know, certain physical or, you know, indicators? I, I mean, I think 
I think there's twofold, right? There, there may be people willing to volunteer and once again, anonymously, you, you can, people can do this anonymously to some server that nobody sees the name immediately gets encrypted and, and the analysis on that is totally on the, on an encrypted name or hash name. I think that's, that's, that's very doable. Um, and, and identifying those at risk people, or if they are, you know, live with people who are at risk as well, too. I think, mm -hmm. I think all of that can absolutely be done, you know, with the HR, um, e even without HR in the loop, um, safely as well. Okay. Um, and then kind of to blend your two points real quick. One, one thing that, you know, we, we always see, you know, at airports or whether people come into the building, you get an IR scan. Um, maybe they detect a fever, maybe not. Um, at Draper, what we've seen in all our standoff physiology history is the odds of you detecting anything meaningful from like a split second scan as you go into the building is, is very limited. There's so much noise there. I think, you know, you're going to do much better if you can persistently check on people during the course of the day, whether it's IR cameras mounted, you know, in the ceilings of factories or you're checking through multiple sort streams of data, looking for coughs on people's phones or through microphones. It's going to take a lot more than I think just a, a quick, you know, IR flash to your head as you enter the building to 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 identify people who are at risk or might be sick. Bill, in your pre-screening, in your assessment, do you include those high risk factors? Uh, well, one of as we talked in the outset of our presentation today, there are a number of different. Um, preconditions or conditions, I should say, regarding a, a, a person's willingness or fitness to uh, to be available to come to work. Um, I'll defer to Dave in terms of the specific information that we might be gathering through Test Utah. However, from as we speak to members of industry, um, I think it's, again, it comes back to is the person well? Are they taking care of other people who are unwell? Are they physically able? Do they have the bandwidth, or do they have, you know, family members at home that need care? Um, do they are or is are are they just? Do they have some mental mental wellness that needs to be addressed? This has been very traumatic. I think I think a number of us, you know, have cabin fever and a little bit of PTSD on a low scale to all of this, right? For those of us in Michigan, thank God everybody could go out and golf and uh, get their boats in the water this weekend. That was a big deal. So, yes, it but, was. But back, yeah, it really was. So, but coming back to it, you know, there are going to be a lot of reasons. And, and again, I just like 0809, there's going to be a part of the population that's just going to opt out, right? Because that's it's been that type of experience. Dave, you want to add any specifics to what we've seen at Test Utah? Yeah, I, I, what, what I see, Carla, is um, having to localize the solution set for each of the um, manufacturers or every company that comes in, and perhaps even by uh, location themselves, uh, by facility. Some facilities are going to be higher risk, higher density environments. They're gonna require perhaps a different level of protocols than say a, a corporate headquarters uh, where people have the flexibility to work remotely and create safe distances a lot easier than say in a close manufacturing facility. So we would work with uh, uh, each of the companies to decide what's appropriate for them. Uh, we have partners as well as um, PhD level, at, we call them XM scientists, so people that, that know how to, how to uh, do these assessments. And uh, of course, we would uh, collaborate with the local boards of health or internal um, health departments within the organizations uh, to make sure that, uh, that whatever, we're at, well, whatever we're assessing is appropriate for that organization in that location. Well, I want to thank everyone. I have more questions, but we're unfortunately out of time. And I know that uh, all this material will be av available on CAR's website afterwards. I think most importantly, you both have systems that, that uh, are adequate for assessing and testing and tracing. And the important thing is that you make that adaptable to whatever your organization uh, dimensions are and that the executives of that company are in 100% concurrence into uh, its adherence as we move forward and hopefully open up our, our workplaces and our factories once again. So thank you all so much for joining us today and thank you to the audience as well.
Thank you. Thank you, Carla.